Many of you may not be aware, but Ms. Xu comes from a family rich in aviation heritage. Her grandfather fought with Chiang Kai-shek in China and later in Taiwan. He was the Lieutenant General in the Taiwanese Air Force and was presented what could be called the Taiwanese Medal of Honor personally by Chiang Kai-shek. This morning, Kuade is honored to be able to recognize her support to Army Aviation and the Army Aviation community by inducting her as a Knight of the Honorable Order of St. Michael. Appearing before a most arduous and discriminatory committee of tried and proven Army aviators and aviation patriots, be it known that the Honorable Heidi Hsu was found worthy of special recognition for outstanding contributions to the community of Army aviation and is hereby inducted as a Knight of the Honorable Order of St. Michael. The Archangel St. Michael is the embodiment of courage, justice, and gallantry. So too, the aforementioned individual embodies these qualities and represents excellence in aviation. Therefore, the President of the Army Aviation Association of America acknowledges that this patriot is due special honor and respect for now and posterity. Given under my hand this 30th day of March, 2015, signed Howard W. Yellen, Brigadier General Retired, President of the Army Aviation Association of America. Congratulations. Okay, you guys definitely surprised me. <laughs> it was a, a, a huge honor to be able to uh, receive this uh, recognition. I really do uh, appreciate uh, my uh, sincere gratitude to Quad A. I can tell you I do have a soft spot uh, for aviators, um, exactly as uh, General Yellen said. My grandfather was an aviator, okay? So I grew up in the aviation community. And, and I never forgot the, what he told me. He received an award from President Chiang Kai-shek. 12 aviators received this award for bravery. Six months later, after the announcement, the ceremony was conducted. And by that time, six of the airmen had perished in the war. Okay. They fought against the communists. They fought against the Japanese. They invaded China. He was a squadron commander. He took an entire squadron to the United States for training for two years. He was eternally grateful to the U.S. And he told me that story and made sure I never, ever forgot it. So here I am as Army Acquisition Executive, a true honor, and I'm truly grateful for the opportunity to serve. Next chart please. So what I would like to do is share uh, with you the state of where we are uh, in terms of the Army fiscal budget. If you take a look at where we were in 2012 to where we are today, basically the research, development, and acquisition account has been the sacrificial lamb. I lost seven billion dollars. It's uh, very difficult in the near term when your top line starts to come down at rapid pace. When we're protecting the military pay and the operation and sustainment costs is going up. So the near term, the only area you can literally squeeze the budget is a research and development and the acquisition account. That means our modernization account. So on the, on the right side, you can see the, as a percentage of the Army top line, the green line down there is the RDA account. It's been shrinking about twice as fast as the Army's top line. And this is what's impacting us. Next. Let me give you some big picture perspective. In terms of Army contracts, if you look at our total obligation, where, we're, where we were in 2011 
to where we are today in 2014. Our buying power is now at 60% of what we had in FY11 in terms of total obligations. Okay. If you look at our contracting actions, 65% of all the contracts that we let are competed. Okay. In terms of business that's given to small business, Army does better than any of the other services. If you look at last year, what we were able to achieve, we achieved 31% of the contracts were awarded as primes to a small business. Because of the Army's leadership in small business, it enabled the Department of Defense to achieve its goal. Next. I can tell you when I first came to the Pentagon, I looked at all the portfolios that we have. Army has more planes than the Air Force. We have more boats than the Navy. We are the biggest service. And one thing that worried me was a lack of a strategic long-term plan. So one of the key things I wanted to do is focus on looking at strategic 30-year outlook. So I know that I spent a fair bit of time to create this uh, PowerPoint. There's a lot of ranges here, but I'm a PowerPoint ranger. Okay. <laughs> so I think from the perspective of strategic guidance and understanding where the emerging threats are heading, not just where the emerging threats are here today, but look ahead. Let's predict where the emerging heads are heading. That's exactly what we need to understand because that needs to drive our concepts, that needs to drive the understanding of where we are in terms of our current capability and our current portfolio, and where are the gaps that we need to close relative to where the threats are going, and identify where are the mature technologies that's within our S&T portfolio that we can close the capability gap, because that's where we need to have ECPs, engineering change proposals, spiral upgrades into our current systems in order for us to close the capability gaps. We need to look at the midterm and longer term capabilities to think about where we need to go in the future generations and prioritize that because those are new programs that we currently don't have, that we need to have in the future, that we need to use our precious S&T dollars to focus on the capabilities to be developed, to give our soldiers a leading edge. We need to look at our sustainment portfolio because 70% of the cost of a weapon system is in sustainment. It is not in design, it is not in procurement. It is in the sustainment tail. And that's what we need to tackle. And this is where I think it is critical for us to loop together the sustainment piece to try to figure out how do we increase reliability, what are the things we need to do to reduce cost. All of that needs to loop together to understand what are the capability trades we are willing to make as a big army. It is, goes back exactly to what General Lundy has talked about. Okay. We have to make difficult trades. I'm happy to say that we're in year three of our long range investments requirements analysis, or the LIRA as the building costs it. Um, We've gotten better every single year in terms of getting more and more people involved in the 30-year investment strategy plan because that's what needs to inform us. I've asked each one of my PEOs to work with the requirements community, the S&T community, and the resourcing community to fully understand what are the things we need to be investing in. Lay out a long-term plan to inform us so we can be ready and share that information with industry so they know where to invest. Most of the industry folks I talk to indicate that they're willing to invest if they only know where we want to go. So this is where it's critical to close the loop. And 
the budget instability that we're living in today, on an annual basis, it is very difficult to plan for the long term because we don't know what next year's budget is going to be. You've already heard about the House is going to mark to the sequestration level. If they mark to the sequestration level, and this happens on an annual basis, it is extremely difficult to plan. Because as I said earlier, the modernization account is the bill payer. So this strategy, having the Lira strategy, will help us to make difficult decisions, to do the trades, to understand what is affordable within our budget. Next. If you look at our president's budget in FY16, the RDA account is $23.1 billion. That's about 18%. We've gone down a fair bit from about 23% the last four years down to about 18%. And now recall, this is the president's request. This is not the sequestration budget. The aviation portfolio is still our biggest portfolio because, as you have heard this morning, it is a critical enabler for our soldiers. It is 26% of our total portfolio. If you look at what we have done, we have protected S&T. The S&T is a sea corn of our future. We have protected that. And as a result, it is now our third biggest portfolio. Next. So how are we going to modernize uh, the Army? So the way I think about it is a very logical thought process. Namely, if you look at the bottom of the pyramid, I talk about a five-layer pyramid. We've got to divest aging system out of our portfolio the stuff that we can no longer afford to maintain because it's really not being used. It's like cleaning out your garage. You've got tons of clutter in there, time to get rid of some of the stuff. Okay? So we're divesting stuff. You have heard about it this morning in terms of uh, ARI. We're in the process of taking seven aviation platforms and reduce it down to four. It's really driven by affordability. The next layer of the pyramid is resetting and sustaining the stuff that's coming out of theater that we need to reset the clock and turn it down, back down to mile zero. Because the next contingency that we fight, we're going to go in with the equipment that we have right now. The next layer up, the middle of the pyramid, is incremental modernization. We do a really good job in terms of buying back capabilities. We've added more and more armor. We added more and more uh, equipment on our aviation platform and ground platform. And as a result, you've lost uh, lift capability. So what we're doing is focusing on buying these capability back in terms of incrementally modernizing our platforms. If you look at the A models, what we have versus the E models, Nowhere is the same. It's far more capable what we have today. If you look at what we're doing in terms of new systems, the next layer up, we are focusing on building new capability in order to increase our mobility. General Lundy talked about the ITEP engine. It's going to increase our mobility. Okay. We need to increase our survivability. He's talked about that and we need to increase our lethality as well. The top layer is the s and We absolutely have to invest in s and to give us a next generation of capabilities that we need in the future. So our strategy is this tiered pyramid, increasing our mobility, survivability, lethality, incrementally upgrading our system, developing critical new capabilities, and innovate for future generations. Next, I'm going to give you a few examples. 
uh, General Lundy actually has already touched upon this. If you look at what we're doing, we're digitizing our cockpit in the UH-60Vs. We're taking the ELF models and digitizing the cockpit. So it will have the same cockpit feel as the M models. This reduces training. It's common sense. It's the right thing to do. What we have in production now is the Apache 64E variant. I can tell you when I was seeing theater, I spoke to some of the Apache pilots who recently received this uh, 64E model, and they are absolutely thrilled. I've had the opportunity to fly in one of them. I can tell you personally, compared to the D model, to the E model, it's a lot less vibration in there. My teeth is not rattling when I'm inside, right? And I can tell you the forward-looking IR for generation two, it's a beauty. You can see a lot clearer, you can see a lot further. Okay, so our uh, pilots are absolutely thrilled. Uh, M models in production, our F Chinook models in production, Great Eagles, we're in production on that, as well as the Shadow. Next. In terms of fixed wing, what we're doing, we're turning a lot of QRC, QRC systems that we have that's contractor-owned, contractor-operated, and turn it into programmer records. Uh, we're basically keeping the platform as is, but what we're doing is upgrading some of the mission equipment system. So we will have the latest equipment as we migrate towards uh, the end state of our uh, platforms. Next. Let's talk about some of the new system we're developing for our aviators. You heard about the ITEP engine. We have uh, invested a fair bit in the s and It is a huge enabler to us. This is something that I personally spoke to General Lundy in terms of priority. This is his number one priority. Okay. Uh, it's going to enable us to increase uh, shaft horsepower from 2,000 to 3,000. It's huge, right? We will be able to fly high and high anywhere in this world. Huge capability. We're, uh, we're, we're ready. We've uh, sent out the draft RFP a couple times already. We've solicited the feedback. We're about ready to send out the RFP for this um, program. So it's very exciting. And I can tell you, uh, both contractors have been working very, very hard to enable this capability. Kirkham, common IR countermeasure is what we absolutely need to counter the next generation of IR threats. Uh, again, this is a program that's, uh, that's gone through technology development. Both companies, uh, Northrop Grumman as well as BAE, has done a magnificent job. We are, uh, we are in RFP right now. Again, we're heading toward uh, RFP and then a uh, down select this summer. Future vertical lift, let's talked about this morning. This is our future. This is where we want to go. We, we want to be able to go faster, further, higher, but affordably. So that's what we are excited about. This is. Uh, the uh, S&T program in FMR, future multi-role, is going to inform us in terms of art possible. We need to shape the requirement so it's going to be uh, affordable and we can achieve it in reasonable time. The so next piece that we're working on in terms of lethality is JAGM. That's a joint air-to-ground missile. It's the next generation of missile that will be able to fire from Apache that will be able to hit moving target and hit camouflage target. It is a huge enabler for our Apache pilots. Uh, that is another program that uh, RFP is out. So we're, we are uh, anxiously waiting for the proposal to come in. Again, we're looking for a down select this summer. Next. S&T, our S&T folks, especially in the aviation community, are very closely tight-knit group 
in terms of working on the critical enabling technology for our future generation of capability. You've heard about the joint multi-role. You have two, uh, two, basically two contractors um, that's uh, working very aggressively and feverishly uh, to do a flight demonstrator by next year. So this is going to be very exciting uh, to watch this. Degraded visual environment, General Lundy has talked about that. This is very critical for us. We're doing an analysis of alternative right now to understand what is the solution space that we need. Uh, we talked in terms of independent sensors, giving us the cue to the pilot, and also in, tie in into improved handling for the aircraft. We talked about the future affordable turbine engine. Again, this is uh, this is the engine that we will need for our future vertical lift. As you have seen, everything we talk about new capability in s and is a critical enabling capability for our warfighter. The biggest stumbling block is not the science and technology. It's not the new capability. The biggest stumbling block that we are in, the biggest challenge we're facing is the budget. If we continue to go with the sequestration budget, I don't know what will happen in the future. We have to continue to make tough, tough decisions as programs continue to stretch out because we want the capability, but we can't afford it. If you go to the next view guide, it shows you what we, the type of tough decisions that we're uh, faced. In terms of new capability for aviation, we talked about increasing mobility and performance and decreasing uh, uh, maintenance. That's what we need to focus on. We talked about increasing our situation awareness. We're it's RFP, uh, we're working on RFP to get the long range radar for our fixed wing platforms. Uh, we are uh, moving on with the next generation of SIGINT capability. We talked about increasing survivability. We're leveraging the Navy, working with them to develop the next radar warning receiver. I, I've talked about the Kirkham. The other key piece we absolutely need is assured PNT, position, navigation, and timing. We have to be able to trust our systems, so we need to have assured PNT. We talked about the DVE. In terms of increased lethality, you guys know that we're delivering the second gen flare onto the Apache today as they're being deployed into theater. We're already working on the third generation of flare. The Army spent 16 years developing the science and the technology for the third gen flare. Okay. Now, we're heading toward a program of record. RFPs going out, we'll be developing the third generation of capability, and that third gen flare development roadmap is closely tied into our Abrams and our Bradleys and our Apaches in the future. In terms of command and control communication, I absolutely agree We've got to sync back up with our platform needs to our soldiers on the ground. Uh, we're, there's two programs that's ongoing uh, in terms of uh, uh, getting the uh, requirements right, in terms of a small airborne Link 16 terminal for our Apache, as well as uh, the SENAR program, which is small airborne networking radio, which is a program that we have budgeted in FY16. Next. So this is what sequestration has forced us. Okay. So Army Aerial Scout, we still have uh, the requirement, except now we don't have the money. We're looking at really low-cost analysis of alternatives. Okay, that's a joke, guys. You can laugh. <laughs> okay. But I am worried about sequestration because it removes our flexibility. It removes our ability to plan and fund programs. On annual basis, we lay our plan. On annual basis, it's cut. 
So the program continues to stretch out and it forces us to make difficult choices and it impacts. In the future, it will impact the lives of our soldier. That's what we're faced with. So thank you very much for being here and listening to me today. And if you get a chance to talk to your congressman, remember, get rid of sequestration. Thank you.